to this webinar uh, with uh, called Reducing uh, the Environmental Impact of Food with Dr. Joseph Poor from the University of Oxford. Uh, Joseph is uh, the um, director of the Oxford Martin Program on Food Sustainability Analytics, uh, and they will be talking about his uh, research uh, in just a few moments. My uh, name is Per Andersjande, and I'm the chair of Food and Environment Information, and uh, non-profit uh, based in Stockholm uh, that uh, focuses on spreading uh, or raising awareness about the environmental impact of food production. And we're also trying to um, promote political measures for a sustainable uh, food system. And uh, these veg forums or Vego forum are part of that. And uh, we're happy to actually uh, be able to um, uh, uh, arrange this webinar in collaboration with Plant-Based Treaty. Uh, which is a grassroots movement to uh, try to halt the environmental degradation caused by animal agriculture. And we'll uh, soon be joined by Nicola Harris, uh, who is the communications director of Plant Based Treaty, and she will handle the QA uh, at the end of the webinar. And you can post your questions uh, right now and uh, all through the talk. and. Uh, Nicola will uh, pick some of the questions up at the end and, and uh, ask them to uh, and ask uh, Dr. Paul to actually um, give answers to these questions. Um, uh, uh, in this introduction, I also would like to uh, mention the importance of uh, political measures and measure, mes measures on a um, um, societal level for uh, being able to um, uh, convert our food system uh, towards sustainability. Uh, and one of the examples that uh, uh, can be useful is to, uh, for cities to promote sustainable and healthy eating in their kitchen and in their communications with their citizens. And we're happy that uh, more and more uh, cities actually are doing this. For example, uh, the city of Edinburgh in the capital of Scotland actually endorsed the Plant Based Treaty uh, uh, very recently, uh, and so have many other cities. And in my own home, the town of Stockholm, uh, uh, they're very um, eager to uh, ramp up the work with sustainable food, and we actually have a small introduction a few words from the mayor of Stockholm, Karin Vangård. Uh, she has, can't be here in uh, person live, but she has recorded a short video about why it's important that uh, public give, um, kitchens actually participate in food sustainability work. So I'll play that uh, small video now and then I'll leave up um, the word to for the screen to do support. If we keep producing and consuming food in the way we do today, we will not reach the Paris Agreement. And the world as we know it won't be the same. A third of all greenhouse gases come from food production. Animal products accounts for more than half of those, mostly from beef and cow's milk. We need to change the way we produce and eat food, but it won't be easy. We are heading into an economic recession and some families are already struggling to put food on the table. Food prices are soaring. Milk, eggs, flour and bread are getting more expensive by the day. The sale of organic products have reduced dramatically when many people cannot afford the slightly higher price. However, you should not blame individuals for not buying the organic food. 
We can't put the burden of the climate crisis on the shoulders of individuals alone. The power of structural change lies on us. Now is the time for states and cities to take a greater responsibility for the food that people consume. The city of Stockholm has set high goals for the years to come. In our city, we have nearly one million inhabitants. The schools, preschools and elderly homes of Stockholm are taking a leap towards organic, plant-based, seasonal and locally produced food. When the city purchases food, it's always with high standards for animal protection and restrictive use of antibiotics. We do this because we know that we have a great responsibility, not only for the environment and animal care, but for our citizens. Stockholm should be an equal city where everyone, whether you come from a wealthy home or not, get good, nutritious and sustainable food. Let's cooperate and take common steps for our just transition in the cities and in the world. Thank you. So, uh, we thank the mayor of Stockholm, Karin Vangård, and now I hand over the screen to our main speaker for the evening, or <laughs> whatever time it is where you are, uh, Dr. Joseph Poor. Hey, um, yeah, thank you very much um, for having me here. I'm really looking forward to presenting. Um, so I'm just going to put my presentation up. So hopefully um, you can see that. If not, <laughs> come in and let me know. Um, but I'm going to talk about some research that I started um, in 2013, 2014, and was published in 2018. And then we've kind of been developing it since then, the paper um, was published in, in Science, um, and it's called Reducing Foods, Environmental Impacts Through Producers and Consumers. There were two aspects of that paper. There was how we change or how we reduce environmental impacts through consumers and um, diets, and that's going to be my focus for today's talk. I'm really going to focus on plant-based diets in particular. Um, you, The um, article, if you just Google... Um, or a NEMI check will come up online and there's all sorts of stuff in that article about how we can change farming practices, how we can move towards outcome-based environmental management in food supply chains. But I'm not going to focus on that today. I'm going to primarily focus on plant-based diets. So this was a view um, out of my airplane window when I used to work in management consulting. Um, this is a view over Eastern Europe and I, I, I was started thinking, you know, why is there so much farmland? Why is there so little nature? Why, what, you know, where, where is all the nature gone? And I left my job and I uh, decided to do some research on agriculture at, at a global level. And as I started to look at land use and how, you know, how land is used on earth, um, I came across these maps by um, Earl Ellis, and you, you see globally that urban areas are kind of, you know, maybe 2% of the world's land, quite substantial. Um, it's a, you know, a lot of land use. Arable land, so land for crops, um, then adds another kind of, t takes that human land use up to around kind of 24%. Quite a lot of land is now used for humans in some form. Obviously, different lands have different intensities, but most cropland globally is, is quite intensive and excludes quite a, a lot of nature. Um, you can also add land for grazing animals, so pastures and kind of extensive rangelands to that. Um, and, and globally, uh, agriculture is, and, you know, other human, agriculture and is using around kind of you know 55% of the world's 
land. Over half the world's land is used by humans for food um, in some format. This is, you know, this is staggering, vast, vast areas of land. Um, another way to kind of look at this data is to, rather than kind of plot it as a map like this, is to plot it in terms of like, you know, which products are using most land. So you can see this map is just showing how much land globally is used to produce dairy products, so milk and cheese. Um, it's an area of land the size of Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Ecuador, just for global, just to meet our demand for dairy products. This is the amount of land that's used for beef and lamb. Um, it's an area the size of land, you know, much of North America and a bit of Central and or all of Central America and a bit of South America too. Pork, poultry, farmed fish, eggs, large users of land globally. You've got extensive rangelands as well, which kind of are used less intensively, but also for beef and lamb production. And then you've got all other food down there. So you've got this kind of striking disparity um, between the land that's used for animal products and the land that's used for other food. As though, you know, despite that being a lot of land, we are still continuing to convert more land every year for food and for agriculture. This is data from a paper um, in Science by uh, Curtis et al. And it's basically saying how much land was cleared, how much you know, forest was cleared for um, commodity crops. And you've got this, you know, we're, we're clearing, you know, in 2016, 2017, eight, you know, nearly nine million hectares a year of land for commodity crops. Again, we can kind of look at what is really behind this land clearance. You get 71% of that land clearance is for animal products. The rest is for kind of all other food. So you've got this, again, this kind of striking disparity. We're not only using a lot of land for animal products, we're clearing more land every year for animal products. We all know that climate change is a, is a major global challenge. So today we are at around 0.9 to 1.2 degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. Um, at around two degrees of warming, it is forecast that coral reefs will mostly disappear. We'll have ice-free summers at the poles and you know 20 trillion of economic damages i mean the the loss of coral reefs is you know it's just a, a, a staggering <laughs> unbelievable um change and a, a tragic loss globally and this is one of the you know this is a challenge we've got to address scenarios that we may be on possibly um are you know may take us to even beyond that four to you know, five degrees of warming by 2100. This is where you've got forest dieback. Um, you've got permafrost thawing, which releases methane, possibly worsening these problems. I mean, this is a staggering global problem of kind of unprecedented proportions. Um, you can look at what's causing that again. So around 26% is food. That's what I, I estimate that I recognize the mayor of Stockholm gave a different estimate, a third. Um, a, a website called Our World in Data and a post by Hannah Ritchie does a very nice comparison of this 26% versus that 33%. If you're interested in the details, I estimate that 26% of global greenhouse gas emissions are related to food um, and a fi another 5% are related to non-food agriculture. Um, so again, we can look at what's, you know, which food products are causing this. Around 60% is your kind of farmed animal products. Another 2% is your kind of, is, is your capture fish. So again, pretty striking disparity. Animal products are really behind a lot of this, um, you, you know, a lot of climate change um, in, in the food sector. So we can, you know, as I've already said, land use, deforestation, greenhouse gas emissions, 80, 70, 60 odd percent of the impact is your kind of farmed animal products. Acidification, another major global um, 
issue related to the you know the deposition of acidifying substances onto forests 60 percent eutrophication another you know the the, the, the excess um, input of nitrogen and phosphorus into um, uh, uh, freshwater and marine ecosystems causing things like um, you know anoxic zones and the, the loss of aquatic life six 57 60 odd percent of um, eutrophying emissions related to animal products. Um, water use is a much lower number. You've seen some, uh, we estimate this is freshwater withdrawal, so irrigation water use. You see different numbers if you think about um, what some of the numbers Cowspiracy reported in terms of, you know, they're saying much higher numbers in terms of animal products, and I'm, you know, I'd be happy to pick up that disparity in the, in the discussion. But I think the key point is pretty of this slide is, is pretty clear. You know, a very large share of foods, environmental impacts relates to animal products, yet they're providing just 37% of our protein, 18% of our calories. A huge disparity in terms of what we're getting back in nutrition compared to the damage that we are causing. So um, the, uh, the study that we published was based on a meta-analysis of um, for data from 40,000 farms um, in most countries globally. Um, and the data we generated considered the full food supply chain. So from the clearing of land for agriculture and all the emissions that causes, um, all, the relate, all the farm operations, fertilizer production, um, irrigation, greenhouses, the manufacture, you know, application and manufacture of fertilizer, um, aquaculture ponds, the emissions they create, um, animals, the emissions they create, food processing, food packaging, transport, and retail. So we did a full um, supply chain assessment using life cycle assessment methods um, to do this. And you can look at the results in a different way to what I was showing before. Rather than the global results, you can look at the range of environmental impacts for different farmers producing a product. So I'll just explain this chart. This is showing the full life cycle environmental impact of producing 100 grams of protein from the different sources lifted, listed down the left. Um, the bottom of the blue bar represents a kind of lower environmental impact farm the, or a 10th percentile global producer. The top of that bar represents a 90th percentile impact farm, so a high impact global producer. Um, so if you take beef produced from dedicated beef herds, um, I've split beef out here into beef that's produced from beef herds and beef that's produced um, from dairy herds, because obviously uh, around about half of global beef production is a kind of a co-product of the dairy industry. So, uh, and I've split it out because of they have very different systems for producing beef. Um, but you can see here at the top, this beef from the beef herd, high impact kind of farm globally is creating around 105 kilograms of CO2 per 100 grams of beef protein, low impact beef producer around 20. So there's a lot of variation within these beef farms. Um, and, I, and as I said at the start of this lecture, we discussed like how you could use that variation to reduce the impacts of beef in the paper separately. Uh, here I'm focusing on the kind of more like the differences between products. So you can also look lamb, slightly lower impacts than your beef, still a lot of variability. Um, farmed crustaceans, again, a lot uh, creating a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, largely due to the fact that you have anoxic sediment buildup at the bottom of ponds, which creates methane, um, just like cows. So. Um, and also farmed crustaceans are often linked to the clearance of, of mangrove forests too. Um, beef, cheese, pig meat, slightly lower impacts, fish down, farmed fish, poultry, eggs. So you're kind of going down in terms of impact. And then at the bottom, you've got your um, kind of plant-based products. So another quite striking disparity, you've got really at the top of this graph in greenhouse gas emissions, your animal products, and at the bottom, your plant-based products. This isn't a random selection of products. These are the main sources of plant-based and animal source protein in, in the human diet. So this is a excluding grains. Grains are a, ma grains are a major source, but I'm not showing them here. Um, you can see them in the paper. 
So, yeah, another big disparity. Also of interest is that it seems that in our, in our data, at least the lowest impact way of producing these animal products still seems to be creating more emissions than your vegetable proteins. So, you know, the most sustainable way globally to, let's say, produce cheese is still creating a lot more emissions than producing, say, tofu. That says that, you know, if you go out into the shops and try and buy the most sustainable cheese on the market, it's still going to be less sustainable than a plant-based protein. Um, we can do the same kind of graphs for different environmental indicators. So I'm plotting here acidification, eutrophication, land use. You get a very similar trend. Plant-based plant -based products at the bottom, animal-based products towards the top in terms of impact. There are some kind of subtleties and nuances um, in these charts. So, you know, nuts can use quite a lot of land, so can, um, but, and, um, but in many cases, it, you know, it's, you know, still quite a lot lower than most, um, you know, because like ruminant meat. Um, eutrophication and acidification follow a similar pattern to greenhouse gas emissions. So you, in general, you've got lower um, impacts and you've also got the case where, you know, the least sustainable, the most sustainable animal producers still typically worse in terms of their impact than, the, you know, your, your vegetable proteins. So these are quite stark charts in terms of what they reveal about the food system. You can do similar charts as well for um, dairy products and plant-based dairy alternatives. So you've got, again, cow's milk at the top, greenhouse gas emissions. You've got a, quite a big range, but pretty high compared to these different plant-based products. Um, in general, the pattern is even you know, it's pretty clear, possible except, you know, an exception around eutrophication for rice milk. Um, but beyond that, really, and, and for, I'm sorry, for water use as well, cow's milk can use relatively little water in terms of irrigation water, whereas some of these products like almond milk can actually use quite a lot of water. Um, but in general, the overall picture is that these plant-based dairy alternatives typically have much lower impacts than your cow's milk. Particularly soy milk and oat milk seem to appear to be kind of towards the more sustainable end of the spectrum for these milks. Um, so what happens then if we change our diets towards a, a vegan diet um, and we get rid of animal products from our diets? So what I'm plotting here is um, on, in this chart is what happens if at a global level, everyone went vegan? Um, this first bar plots the total amount of eutrophication um, created by all sectors of the economy. So you've got around, you know, around 85 million tons of phosphate equivalent. They're released from all sources, sewage, agriculture, um, factories, with agriculture, as I said before, being a you know, major driver of eutrophication. So you've got a 40% reduction in your no animal products diet of global eutrophication across all sectors of the economy. It's a pretty big, uh, you know, radical, massive change. Land use, something, you know, what I was talking about right at the beginning, globally, a total agricultural land use falls by 75% if we, you know, adopt a plant-based diet. Arable land use in particular, so just cropland, falls by 20%. A lot of people say, oh, you know, vegan diets would use more cropland. That's not what you see in the data, nor, not, not in our data, nor in other studies that I've seen. You actually see a reduction in cropland use as well. And the reason for that is that many animals are fed concentrate feed. Um, so stuff like soy um, or stuff like, um, you know, palm oil expeller, etc. Um, and the benefits um, where, you know, changing out of, you know, reducing consumption of animal products reduces the, the need, you reduce the amount of feed required, which reduces overall arable land, the amount of, you know, extra food that you would intake in terms of plant-based equivalents doesn't even come near to you know, switching that the other way around. You can also plot a map of what the world would look like from kind of space if 
we adopted a plant-based diet. Now, I don't have the full modeling to be able to do this um, properly. Um, and I'm really interested in working with systems modelers to be able to explore this. But the, the, this map kind of just gives a rough indication of kind of the potential amounts of land we might spare in green, um, whereas yellow is the probably the land that would remain in, in agricultural cultivation under a vegan diet. But this, you know, in, in green, you're sparing huge amounts of land globally. If you, you know, if you looked at the planet from a different, you know, star or from a different or from a satellite or whatever, the earth would re-green uh, at a huge, huge level. Um, you know, another way to think about these land use benefits, so if you take the land per person on Earth, so if you take all the land on Earth and divide it by the human population, there's about 17,000 metres squared of land per person, which is not actually very much. It's like you know, a few football pitches of land. It's a, you know, the world is a quite a small place, really. Our global diet currently uses around 6,000 metres squared of that land. And there's your no animal products diet, 1,500 meters squared of land per person per year. This is a, a radical drop in the land that we could use. And you think about all that spared land. Obviously, there are lots of different things that could we could do with that land. One option is to simply let it um, go back to nature. And I'll talk about that in a sec. But there are many other options. Um, one option which I'll also talk about in a minute, is you could use it for biofuels and substitute out demand for things like petrol um, or other fossil fuels, um, diesel, etc. Another option is we could expand the amount of land we use for farming, but reduce the intensity. So maybe the world could go completely organic um, or very low intensity farming with no pesticides, for example. Um, but just considering a situation where we don't where we just let the land go back to nature um these are very rough estimates that i did which is just to say how many what's the total number of birds that that 4700 meters squared of land could host what are the number of mammals what are the number of reptiles what are the number of amphibians you can see you know we, we are bringing life back to earth we're also storing you know, the, that, that land at a global level from a really nice paper by Kurt Schmidiger, who I noticed is one of the plant-based um, treaty signatories in, in 2012. He's really one of the first people to look at this. Is he said, okay, under a kind of plant-based diet, how much carbon would be stored if that land went back to nature, the land you spare? And globally, on average, we're, you know, it's, we're talking about storing around 150 tonnes of carbon dioxide in plants and in soil. So I'll just put that into a bit more context, but just as a kind of you know, headline numbers, this land that you spare from changing diet brings back biodiversity, it stores carbon. So if you, just to put that kind of um, carbon number into context a bit more, these are global greenhouse gas emissions per person, that bar on the left, you know, we're kind of around about seven and a half tons of um, CO2 equivalents per year per person. Um, a plant-based diet would reduce that by around 30%. So you've got the benefits of your emissions reduction in terms of, you know, less cows producing methane, um, you know, less, less growing crops to feed animals. But you've also got the benefits of all that in green, of all that land, um, or the nature on that land, or the, or the vegetation on that land, regrowing and storing carbon. Um, so this is a, you know, this is a very large number for diet change, and I think it still, you know, a, a, a lot, a lot of people have missed out that green bit in when when they think about diet change. You see some people saying, "Oh, a vegan diet is, you know, going to save two percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, or five percent." And the reason they get such low numbers is they don't consider the full life cycle of the product, everything from you know deforestation right through to retail and packaging. And they also don't consider this carbon sink, um, and they, that, that's you know their, their major emissions in those, you know emission uh, omissions sorry omissions in their emissions calculations. And yeah, when you account for that, you get this much bigger reduction. 
that doesn't mean there's not a lot of other stuff that we should be doing. You know, you've got a lot of gray left in that no animal products bar. And I think we need to, you know, that bar in total has got to shrink by, you know, a lot, I can't give you the exact number off the top of my head, but it's got to shrink by a lot more to get to kind of 1.52 degrees. So, you know, we still need to do everything else in our lives, you know, don't, you know, minimize all your flights or don't fly, you know, you know, insulate your homes, all, all the all the kind of stuff that we know we need to do to tackle our climate change emissions at an individual level and also with the stuff you guys are doing at the societal level. One of the interesting things though is that in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change Scenarios, they have in the kind of trajectory to achieve 1.5 or 2 degrees of warming, this massive um, negative emissions zone. Um, so that's everything in kind of blue. So your black is, you know, we've got to reduce our fossil fuels to much lower levels than we have now. Um, whereas you, you've also got to generate negative emissions. You've actually got to take carbon dioxide out of the air. Yeah, and the, the main kind of scenario they currently see as being able to do that is called BEX, Bioenergy Carbon Capture and Storage. And for this BEX scenario, you need a lot of land. <laughs> you need a lot of farmland. So one of the things that I don't feel is that the, the IPCC is quite reconciled is where are we actually going to get that land? How, you know, to achieve 1.5 degrees, we need a lot of land. Where are we going to get it from? I think hopefully those previous slides that I've shown give the answer. We need diet change to free up and liberate large amounts of land, both for natural, you know, revegetation growth, for rewilding to bring species back, but also for this kind of negative emissions, this growing bioenergy crops that substitute out fossil fuels and, um, and the carbon storage that that creates. <coughs> um, and another interesting thing is just to plot like, you know, different actions that people can take in, in, in their lives. So just going back to what I was saying on the previous slide, um, another criticism I've, I've heard is that, oh, you know, a vegan diet is actually not that important in terms of your, you know, other actions you can take to cut your greenhouse gas emissions. That's not what we um, see in our data. This is just data for Europe, um, comparing different things you can do in your in your you know in your life to reduce your emissions go car free or you know avoiding one transatlantic flight you know your vegan diet is right up there at the top as you know the most powerful action you can take in your life um, really to reduce you know your, your kind of personal life to reduce your emissions and it's not just the biggest way to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions you know a vegan diet is the single biggest way to reduce your land use, your eutrophying emissions, your acidific, you know, a major way to reduce um, acidification potential, deforestation, um, uh, water use, um, and some other things that we didn't consider in the paper. A vegan diet probably generates massive benefits for like pesticide use. As I said, we could, with, with the land that we spare, you could reduce. Um, intensity of agriculture. So, you know, taking it as a whole picture, there probably is nothing more powerful in an individual's life to address their environmental impact than changing their diet um, towards a, a vegan plant-based diet. Um, obviously, as we go on that trajectory towards plant-based, <coughs> we, and w which we hopefully will as, you, you know, humanity, we can move towards that kind of plant-based diets in a more sophisticated way. And if we can change people's consumption of animal products to, to avoid the highest impact animal products, that can achieve a lot of benefit quickly. So this scenario says, what if we reduce our consumption of each animal product, so beef, poultry, um, dairy, by 50% by targeting the highest impact um, animal product producers first. Um, that can achieve 70% of the benefits of, of the full vegan diet. So your 50% reduction in animal products can achieve 70% of the full environmental benefit. <clears throat> you also see this for other products. It's not just meat. We can also 
use these kind of same effects of targeting the very the least sustainable producers and reducing consumption for them first. You, you know, things that we over consume as well as meat are things like oils, sugars, unfortunately, alcohol, <laughs> stimulants. Uh, so like coffee, cocoa, chocolate, um, you know, and reducing consumption of these by 20% by avoiding the highest impact producers can reduce our um, intake, uh, can reduce our Im impacts by 45%. So as we go on this trajectory to reducing animal product consumption, we can, and, uh, you know, making our diets overall more, um, you know, healthy is to you know, target the, the least sustainable animal product producers first. And the only way we can really do that is if we actually generate more information on who those um, least sustainable producers are. Um, and that's like a key part of the research that I do. It's a key part of the imperative, you know, a lot of the research, you know, lots of um, organizations are doing now to understand the environmental impacts of their supply chains. Um, it's a key motivator for things like food environmental impact labeling so you actually know the impacts of different producers of different products so um your know, plant-based treaty has was said at the beginning is focused on getting cities to sign up to the treaty which i think is a really exciting and innovative idea so i quantified the benefits of the two kind of cities that have signed up to the or two, two of the cities that have signed up to the plant-based um, treaty. So, you know, what if Edinburgh, the whole of Edinburgh went vegan? Um, this is based on a population of about 500,000 people. Um, I estimate that would save an area of land the size of the Lake District National Park, which if you're not from the UK, this is one of the biggest national parks in the UK. Um, you know, it's a large area of land. Um, so just Edinburgh, you know, cutting out its meat, eggs, dairy, fish, um, etc. You're sparing this massive amount of land. The lake, you know, we would potentially you you would enable the creation of a new Lake District National Park, and a lake it would be you know not like the Lake District we have now, which is basically a bunch of farmland. It would be pristine nature um, if we if if we did it well. Um, and what about greenhouse gas emissions? I estimated 1.7 million tonnes of CO2 equivalents could be saved. That's the same as about half a million cars being taken off the road for a year. Um, you know, these are pretty major benefits that you can achieve at the city level. Um, what about Stockholm with a population of nearly a million people? I, I got from online. Uh, I don't know your national parks in Sweden very well, but uh, I estimated uh, nearly 200,000 hectares of land, which is an area the size of the Sarek National Park. Um, you know, but we are talking large land areas that could be liberated and spared by these cities adopting plant-based diets. Again, talking about nearly a million cars off the road if, if Stockholm goes vegan equivalents. You know, these are very, very large benefits to um, cities adopting plant-based diets. I think it's a really great initiative that the plant-based um, treaty is doing. I think it's essential to get more cities signed up and really get those cities committing to, uh, you know, delivering on what they've committed to. Um, I thought I'd just have a little, just say, you know, what I'm focusing on in terms of my research at the moment, focusing on quite a few different things, but one of the things that I'm really interested in is, is, is veganic farming. This is a farming, this is a picture from a organic, a veganic farm near Oxford. And the idea is that you have um, an organic system and organic systems in general require quite a lot of animal, sorry, animal manure <clears throat> or slurry as an input to you know, deliver the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that plants need. Veganic systems are completely animal free, they're organic and animal free. Uh, you know, it's a really interesting type of farming. They generate um, nitrogen and phosphorus through crop rotations and through, um, <coughs> you know, bringing in things like tree bark and stuff like that. So it's a completely, it's a system where you go to organic, so pesticide-free, you know, synthetic fertilizer-free system, 
and you're doing it without animals as part of the system. And the farms, the veganic farms that I've been on, are you know typically you know the ones that I've seen are biodiversity rich. This is a really beautiful farm. Um, there's a network of veganic farms all the way across Europe producing. Um, so I'm kind of really interested in doing a environmental impact assessment of these farms or at least a sample of them to understand like what you know how sustainable is this animal completely animal free completely pesticide free system of farming is it you know can we can it compete on an environmental basis with um, modern farms you know some problems might be that the yield the crop yields are a lot lower um, you know maybe the um, you know, maybe there are other issues caused by these systems. So it's something I'm really interested to explore. But if we can prove that, or provide good evidence, sorry, not prove, but provide good evidence that veganic is quite sustainable, I think that's a very interesting um, conclusion for scaling up veganism to um, the kind of global level and ensuring that that scale up is, you know, truly sustainable and can, um, yeah, so. I'm, yeah, please get in touch with me on my email, which is, you can just find on the internet if you are interested in you know, collaborating or funding or doing environmental modeling related to this. I'm actively looking for collaborators at the moment. Um, thank you very much to everyone um, for attending. Yeah, and thank, I understand there's a really big turnout on, online for this. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. And yeah, thank you for organizing. So. Thank you um, to everyone who's tuned in. Um, I'd like to express the deepest gratitude um, to Dr. Joseph Paul for taking time out today to share his invaluable knowledge and groundbreaking research with us. Um, I, I, for myself, I found the figures from Edinburgh and Stockholm mind-blowing. Um, and if we can just use this data ourselves and get it into the hands of the right policymakers and institutions, I feel that it has the potential to completely transform our food system to one that allows us to live within our planetary boundaries. Um, thank you for everyone who's posted questions in the chat. Um, and the first one that we'll put to Dr. Joseph Poor is about um, the contribution of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, why is there so much variation about the contribution of animal farming in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? There are different studies that seem to reach different conclusions. Um, in the chat, uh, Deborah Shapiro and a few others sort of picked up on this. Um, I know that the UN FAO's new model, Gleam 3, cites just 11.1%. And so could you help us understand why there's so much different variation across the different studies? Uh, yeah, uh, so the I'm not familiar enough with the newest Gleam model. I'm familiar with the Gleam model that came before that. Um, and they've got a pretty similar system boundary and the previous Gleam model was coming up with around kind of 18% for total animal products, which is so animal products from a, you know, create both food and non-food products like leather and, um, you know, wool and stuff like that. So in my numbers, I was just showing food, but there's obviously non-food contribution of animal products and life cycle assessment is designed to estimate impacts at the product level. So if you take animal products impacts across food and non-food, um, we were estimating around 18% of global annual greenhouse gas emissions. I think the previous Gleam model was around 17, 16%, so pretty close. The new one has really changed. I, I have seen that, um, but I'm not entirely sure what is causing that. Um, there's a post um, on the Breakthrough Institute website. <laughs> um, it was out about three weeks ago, and that post looks at the kind of, it tracks like the history of estimates of greenhouse gas emissions from animal agriculture. Um, so if you're able to find that post from the Breakthrough Institute, that's got quite a clear explanation of these different numbers as well as the gleam one that's been published i, I looked at this article another one has come out which says 30 percent seems a bit on the high side 
to me based on the numbers I've seen. But I think a lot of this comes down to the fact that there are simply different ways to model this. Obviously, some models are a lot better and more accurate than others. The major challenge is it's quite difficult to reconcile these models to, you know, the accuracy of your models to other data. But I think to answer that question, I would refer to that, the Breakthrough Institute website and that post they had a few weeks ago. Uh, that's the best I can do on this off the top of my head. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we've had another few questions here. Um, so someone has asked, what are the biggest challenges that you've heard against your research? And, and then another person, Martin Muller, has also asked, have you like re received any rebuttals or criticism from the meat, dairy, egg industries um, as a consequence of your study? Uh... Yeah, I think there've been a f so there've been a few challenges, but no, I don't think there've been any. Well, there haven't been any in you know flaws or anything revealed in the study. The study's robust. Um, it's been used by you know probably like tens of thousands of people now in terms of reusing the data, using the analysis. Um, quite a few companies have built established themselves off the spreadsheet that I built and so there is heavily used it's been heavily sent checked and there's nothing erroneous that's been detected so far in the data so from a kind of methodological perspective and from a data from a data perspective I think it's, it's good um, from a methodological perspective um, I think some people have said that the way that I you know, I treat land use is too um, simplistic and that land is used at very different intensities in different systems. So some animal farming systems like grazing land systems actually use land at very low intensities. Um, whereas I just take the total area of land that is used um, and don't account for the intensity of that land, apart from to distinguish it between cropland and pasture. So I do, I do obviously split between cropland and pasture. Um, on, on that point, I think it is a fair point. Um, and it's obvious that there are different intensities of land use. Um, in general, as land use intensity goes down, though, the total amount of land used goes up. So you've got a bit of a kind of inverse relationship there between, you know, if you want to use land at a very low intensity, you've got to use more of it. So the total amount of kind of, you know, impact is higher. Some some people in the past have tried to correct for that by considering something called net appropriation of primary production, where you basically look at how much is being taken out of a natural ecosystem in terms of like grass and other, and how much disturbance there is this modeling is you know subject to issues as well um and i think in future research it would be interesting to look at that kind of different land use intensities but i think what is clear though is that however really you use pasture land um, apart from you know in the very rarest maybe the kind of five percent of systems globally you know that mo the majority of systems are worsening outcomes for biodiversity and for nature and it's simply better to use less land than more um, apart from you know very exceptional cases um like uh hay meadows or things like that where there are there are certain biodiversity benefits to keeping it in cultivation that doesn't mean you need to keep it in cultivation and eat animal meat though you know so you, you could keep it in cultivation to for other purposes, um, but you've got to create the economic rationales, I guess, you, it could be the argument. So that's kind of one criticism that has come up on land use intensity. I don't think, I don't think changing that will change the results. Um, another criticism that's come up is I didn't consider pesticides in the data. Um, and one of the, you know, major but very unknown area of the damage humans are doing globally to you know, non-human animals it is the emissions of pesticides and also to ourselves, the emissions of pesticides into ecosystems and also the effects that pesticides are having on humans. 
And so a common indicator in life cycle assessment is pesticide toxicity or ecotoxicity or human toxicity. Um, and we weren't, there, there simply wasn't enough data um, in the studies we collected to generate estimates of pesticide toxicity. And I do, you know, that's one of my regrets from the study. It's something I really wish I had included because it's a very important issue to me. Um, we are rebuilding Poor and Nemechek 2018 um, with, there's a new version that's we're kind of slowly releasing online at hestia.earth. Um, so it's in development, it's a project, it's probably going to take us another two or three years to get another big data release like Poor and Nemechek, but that will have pesticide toxicity. It will have differing land use intensities. It will have a much bigger sample of farms rather than the 40,000 were in that paper, more like you know, 40 million farms. Right. So, and you know, much more depth, many, many more food products as well will be included. Um, so yeah, keep your eyes on that, on that space on hestia.earth, but be aware it is a in progress research project and it, you know, don't you trust the results until they're published kind of thing. Um, yeah, those, th th those are two criticisms that I've had. And as, as I said before, I don't think there's nothing has come up yet that at all undermines the, the data. In fact, the robustness of the study has been proven even more by the, by the heavy usage that it's had. Thank you, that's amazing. Um, next question, what would your um, plant-based milk of choice be based on the data that you've discovered? Uh, yeah, okay, good question. Um, yeah, I think that's a really difficult one because I, I have a, a local oat milk company that does a, like a very fresh bottled, glass bottle, returnable bottle oat milk. Um, in, I live near Manchester and it's a really amazing product. Um, and I maybe I should email them and see if they want to do an environmental impact assessment with me. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't done that yet. But I think probably uh, you know, oat milk does tend to come out quite well on the numbers. It's got, unlike, um, it's got a slightly lower protein content though than um, soy milk. Um, so soy milk has an equivalent protein content to to dairy milk around kind of three, three point five percent. Whereas oat milk, you you'd be hard pushed to get kind of one point five two percent protein out from an oat milk. Like oatly, I think has about one percent. Um, so I think if you're going for protein in your in your milk, probably soy is a better option. It does perform pretty well, and you can get soy that is produced in Europe. Brands like uh, Provermel. I think is entirely an uh, entirely European soy. So it'd be like French and Spanish and Italian soy mainly. Um, and a lot of, so it's, you know, it's not gonna be coming from any areas with deforestation or current deforestation risk. And, you know, it's typically quite good agricultural practices as well. Um, so yeah, soy or um, oat, I think come out best in the data. But I'm also really interested in novel um, plant-based milks. I think hemp milk looks very promising and interesting. Um, it's got a quite a good flavor profile um, and a very good amino acid composition as well. So I think definitely keep, keep my eye out for these new ones coming on the market. And interestingly as well, so there's new soy cultivars being released to grow in kind of UK conditions as well. So yeah, maybe in the future we have UK soy. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, there has been a real buzz around the term regenerative agriculture and grass-fed. Um, we hear that a lot in the environmental movement. Um, some groups and also policymakers promote the idea as a climate solution. Um, but what, what would happen if we switch the current food system we have to re regenerative agriculture? Uh, regenerative isn't like at the moment I would say a very well defined term it's not like organic where there are standards you know exactly what it means regenerative as I understand it is a combination of, you know, for arable systems it's things like no-till um, things like stubble retention uh, crop rotation um, it's things like you know it's basically it's basically a kind of reaction to the monocropping 
or corn soy systems of Central America, it really is my understanding of where it's come from. And actually the practices that they're advocating are, you know, in regenerative, actually kind of standard agricultural practices anyway, in, in a lot of countries. And really regenerative is, as I've seen it, is a kind of more of an American movement away from that very intensive you know systems that they have but i would say it's still not very well defined in terms of exactly what it is in terms of an animal production system it's it's like grass-fed it's you know herbal lays it's rotational grazing it's stuff like that um again not very well defined so i think firstly the regenerative guys need to define what they mean by their their term and then it could be you know we might be able to do some analysis um on to understand like how sustainable it is but if you just take grass fed for example um and we say okay let's just consider grass fed um it, the ability to grass feed cows really depends on like the geography um and to, on, on what you're trying to produce like new zealand for example can seem to do grass fed very well um there's been a lot of strange government pressures to shift towards high shares of concentrate feed in the diet so all that you know benefits that new zealand has in terms of very you know you very productive grasslands is kind of been weirdly dissipated by government policy but some countries like new zealand can produce very well on grass and some countries and geographies is just not possible and you can't produce commercial level yields without <clears throat> feed particularly concentrate feed if you're really going for beef beef systems you know grass fed takes can take quite a lot of time um require very large areas of land compared to concentrate feed so you know, it's, again really context dependent as i said in the very first few slides though even if you look at the most sustainable ways to produce beef and in those charts they are showing there's grass fed there's concentrate fed there's all sorts of different systems in all sorts of countries even the most sustainable ways of producing beef and other animal products still creating more impact than plant-based foods so why not just go plant-based <laughs> i agree <laughs> um so we've got time for one more question um so a leak draft of the latest IPCC report shows that there were calls for a shift to a plant-based diet, but these seem to have been lobbied and against, and they were removed from the final summary. Um, so plant-based, the word plant-based was completely removed. Um, what, what can we all do to support, you know, those in the scientific community doing this research to help make sure that this important research isn't si silenced and that it gets to the right people? Um, you know, and how do we get more of the scientific community on board with the benefits of a plant-based diet? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I've experienced similar issues like this with some of the stuff that I've done across quite a different, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I've still got very good relationships with the people I've worked with in, in these areas. And you, what it really comes down to is, you know, people perceive science as just putting out like facts about the world or and that is obviously partially true but in you know the area of science that we're in or that i'm in you know like environmental science is science built on a whole load of value judgments so someone said somewhere that we should care about climate change we should reduce our emissions we should um you know we should not you know let the planet warm and we should care about the consequences of that other people said okay we should protect humans from pesticide exposure and so you've got these value judgments which not everyone actually agrees upon um and then science we're kind of building on top of that so once someone said we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions you know we can go along and say okay we're going to quantify the emissions of these products these practices these countries these different regions we can identify solutions to reduce these impacts um and it's quite difficult to you know really unpick the value judgments that sit underneath a lot of this stuff and when someone you know whether it's a policymaker trying to represent their 
constituents or themselves or whatever their interests are, or whether it's an organization trying to represent themselves or their interests and their profits, or whatever it is, some people from different groups, you get a lot of conflict. And pe some people say, oh, just listen to the science or just, you know, that, that's not really how it works at all. The science is built on, in environmental science in particular, it's built on value judgments. And it's actually, let's listen to the science given these value judgments. So if someone says, I don't care about climate change, <laughs> there's not much more you can really do in terms of, you know, listening to the science isn't, you know, you might persuade them with a few more facts, but that's, a, you know, that's really, you know, there, there are limits and it's really about, you know, this critical role to changing values that people have also got to take into account. And one of those values might be trust and transparency, that we think trust and transparency is important. And if we do think that, there shouldn't be suppression of things like, you know, facts about plant-based diets. Um, another value might be, you know, we should care about other species just as much as humans or other species weighted by their, were given, you know, weighted by their capacity to suffer or to reason or some in some way, and you would then build up value judgments around that. But I think what we really need to move these debates forward is a kind of better ethical, philosophical system to allow us to more clearly separate science and ethics or facts and values out and allow us to have debates around those different areas um, and really separate it out. And that's very hard. That's really hard, really hard stuff to do. Um, but for me, that's that's like critical to actually moving forward with these debates and pushing things forward. It's really revealing the value judgments that people have in these discussions early on um, and separating out the science from the values. That's what I've got to add to that. I, I might be wrong. <laughs> So, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joseph Poor, for a very informative talk and for um, answering all the questions. Uh, and also a big th thanks to Nicola Harris and the rest of the plant-based treaty team. And of course, I would also like to thank Mayor of Stockholm, Karin Weingold, for her inspirations, uh, inspirational words in the beginning of the uh, webinar. And uh, not least, I would, of course, like to thank, thank you in the audience, because it's very inspiring that so many people are participating. And I know many of you are involved in politics and in the environmental movement, and I really hope that um, the information you received today from Dr. Yusuf Poor will um, be useful in your work. And uh, I can say that you should uh, also keep an eye on your inboxes because everyone will get um, uh, an email where we share the, inf the findings from Edinburgh and Stockholm that uh, Joseph mentioned in his uh, talk. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And uh, thanks you, thank you everyone for participating. Uh, see you next time. Bye bye.